session where we will be having a very intriguing panel discussion with four experts discussing the very contentious Data Act and the topic lineup would be about in-between policy and practice. So during this session you can expect to be hearing five to six, a dozen most contentious points on this proposal that we know as Data Act. So I will now pass the floor to our great lineup of speakers. The state is yours. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and moderate this discussion. Now let me introduce our speakers. Myself, uh, my name is Jan Zekuntowski, uh, and I'm a PhD researcher at Kuzminski University. Um, with me is Marta Bayer-Katzenberger, um, responsible for uh, digital strategy, for DGA, for Data Act, um, at the European Commission. Uh, Feio Sikinga, uh, regulatory counsel at the Bird and Bird, uh, assisting uh, clients with uh, regulation uh, throughout its life cycle, as I heard from you. Uh, and Francesco Vogelesa, uh, policy analyst at the Open Future Foundation uh, and a fellow of uh, Data Spheres Initiative. Um, so the three of them represent, we have this perfect mix here, uh, policy mix, as some people speak. Uh, we have the perfect mix of uh, business, uh, civil society, uh, and the regulator side. So first of all, I will uh, give the, uh, the pointer to Malte, who will actually introduce the Data Act uh, quite briefly. What is it? What are the main points? So we are all on the same page in this discussion. Thank you, Jan. Welcome to everyone. I want to find my slide deck. Let's see what happens here. That's the launch pad session already. That's not the right slide deck, but it doesn't matter. Um, wait, it matters. Uh, it would be easier for you to follow that one exactly. I'll start off saying, well, thanks very much for having me on stage. I mean, some people know me, I've been not the first time to my data, and uh, a friend of my data, and it's maybe one of the reasons why you are in the EU data strategy. Um, we heard this morning as well that we may have a tsunami of regulations. I mean, when I started off reflections on the legislation, people were saying, Regulations are slow, the world of digital is fast, the competition is not enforced, and I think this mandate of the Commission really uh, shows that there was a lot of will to do things, and uh, maybe also sometimes, um, maybe break things, but break them fast. Don't quote me on this one, uh, um, because we also will try, I mean, that's to, to do things quickly, uh, and as evaluate also quickly later. So always look at the length of the review clause, which is kind of not necessarily a sunset clause in the regulation, but we're willing to also to learn. But we want to move fast. Uh, that's really a message. Um, the key considerations of the data strategy of the European Union uh, are to agree to leverage the potential of data for AI, but not only, unleash the power of digital services, empower people with their data, reduce friction costs, we will speak about data spaces later. It's all about trust and about reducing friction costs, at least for me, and transaction costs. And then one of the, thing, uh, the first pieces is probably that we'll speak about intermediaries, which was actually on this previous slide, basically a nice thing. I don't know whether Jack Harding is in the room, it's the ODIs work on data uh, institutions, as they call them. But he's somewhere here, and he led that project, and that's a great map. If you could zoom in, you would see a lot of terms that pop up in terms of data trust, Data, um, data portals, um, European Open Science Cloud, they're all somewhere hidden on these islands, clusters a bit, maybe the my data operators should be there, but they're not there by name, but on the island that looks like a human, uh, there are indeed also these services. So the first, I think, deliverable under the data strategy is to really say we need data intermediaries, and we need them in different forms. And we'll speak a bit more about the Data Governance Act, which is now just recently published, our first, really first done thing, and I was personally involved to push that out. Three types of data intermediaries, like public sector data, fin data style, second, my data operators, plus a number of business-oriented uh, data marketplaces as a second type of intermediaries. Potentially also fiduciaries or data trusts as an emerging model. Cooperatives will come to that. 
and uh, then data altruism organizations, the third type of intermediaries. So that we bring, really, that we professionalize the sharing while keeping uh, everyone to say whether to share or not to share. With the Data Act, we will slightly change that for a number of things. But before doing so, I want to say on the Digital Markets Act, which is really the fin the fin finalization phase of the textual finalization, uh, you also have two important uh, data elements. First is uh, a portability right, which is reinforced. The message is make Article 20 GDPR work for the mega platforms, which qualify to be the gatekeeper, complying with certain threshold requirements, which I can't tell you by heart, which would have really high, so that we may capture maybe 10, 15 companies globally and in Europe. So the, the mega, the mega platforms. Uh, but portability right there for personal data, according to Article 20, but working, and for non-personal data for the business users as well. The Data Act, uh, I'll, I'll deepen it in a little moment, and the EID as well, because I think this is also important for this community. And digital services is more like on how content can be displayed, what content should be taken off, and you know that it's, it's not my expertise, so just putting it on the map here. It's less a data thing, it's more like a web content thing. And finally, AI regulation is also, as you know, about risks that come from use of AI systems, and we saw some this morning in the accident talk earlier. So, um, the Data Governance Act, I said we have specific uh, a rule on neutral intermediaries. I'll look at that in a, uh, a second. I spoke about the next two points, but then there's also a call to really look at interoperability via the European Data Innovation Board as needs to channel also interoperability quests and prioritize a bit what we wanted to do on interoperability. Because it's the task is quite humongous and we heard the term a lot, but I can't really make sense how to just organize the prioritization of where to start and where to, to go next. On the intermediaries, I think that's really important for this community, uh, and you recognize maybe some, some names here. It's a number of things, um, not only the my data operators, and um, yeah, I said we want to professionalize, sorry, I'm going to take a photo off the previous slide, um, because it's colorful, and uh, there's a lot of logos, maybe your own. Um, a lot of different things, but I will show you in the second next slide what for us hangs together, which is really that it's bringing supply and demand together in different forms, sometimes in stable ecosystems, like Blue Cloud is the Brussels cargo airport's ecosystem for uh, um, exchanging uh, cargo information, incoming goods, off shipping by, by transport for trade forwarders, uh, and then the ground handling as, as a middleman and really exchanging the information where is that container at this very point in time. And then there's a lot of other use cases, and we will can probably speak about some of those. These are the policy objectives really to professionalize the data sharing, uh, to bring trust, and also to allow, and that's important in the new model that we want to juxtapose to the existing model of data brokering, is value capture. And that comes with the neutrality requirement. Uh, is that these services are essentially meant to do matchmaking. Matchmaking between supply and demand, but retaining all the potential to the one who puts out his data for uh, on a marketplace or for a pooling situation, that the value capture stays with you. So in the complex example of a joint data pool, it should be a pro rata revenue from any use that comes. The fiduciary that runs across you should be the one that gets a fixed fee for operating the system but it should not speculate on the value of the data. And that's really the critical message for these new intermediaries. Don't bet on the value that the data may have. You are just a transmission agent. And now we hope that there's a, a business model can also work on this rather old world uh, kind of model, take money for a commission fee for transmitting data and facilitating the exchange and do some added value services that facilitate the exchange. But otherwise, don't speculate that you will ever use the data because you will be prohibited by law to do so uh, if you qualify for, for, this, uh, for this definition. I'll try to be uh, fast. I said, gave you a little glimpse on the Digital Markets Act. And now on the Data Act, uh, that's the second piece I'm directly working on, which is now we're saying portability across sectors, but for what? And we have done some past work on what we call the machine-generated data, where we looked at the rollout of IoT and said, well, there's maybe a cross-cutting issue. I 
own or rent a machine. It captures what I do with that machine. I should have at least a right to use and port that data just for the mere fact that I have this device in my uh, legal control as a renter or as, a, as an owner. It cuts across a lot of models of servitization. That's quite clear. And a lot of manufacturers now talk to us, yeah, well, but I'm, I'm investing in making these products that will perform and what, what's in it for me? And um, that's where we also uh, currently seeing what have. the message to the manufacturer is you retain the right to use that data. And you know also first, for anyone else, what data your object will generate. So you have head time of one, two, three years to think about the services. No competitor has that. You know who bought your object. You have immediately a client network that you can approach for offering services. And third, you can also design, if you can and if you want, the, the object in a way that, it, that certain data flow back to you. So you also have a third competitive advantage over any competitor. That's not going to go all the way because someone will put the product on the market and that person always will retain a natural advantage in these three respects. But on top of that, if you feel you're unhappy with the range of services offered by the manufacturer or his kind of business partners, you should have a right to take your data somewhere else. Uh, you should also be unhappy with the service that he offers or she and say, I want a, a service from someone else. That's really competition in the subsequent markets uh, of these IoT objects. So I think we, we think with the emerging IoT consumer and business facing, we heard about farmers this morning, uh, we really have, we can, can really stimulate competition. So that's a, a second, I think, big, big thing for portability. I'll go fast because time is also clicking fast. But B2G, that's maybe my last word, um, is something where we say government should have a flexible access to a privately held data. We'll discuss this in the panel, under which conditions, and then there are rules in cloud switching. I'll skip the EID because it's a subject in itself. You have it on my slides, and that's my intro kickoff on the puzzle and the tsunami of regulation. Perfect, thank you. I'll have a direct feedback to this, and uh, it's a single slide, so it's going to be super fast and super quick. Um, can I ask for this? Okay, cool. It's mostly on uh, the B2G data sharing, and we feel uh, we partnered together with uh, the Open Future Foundation to think how we can improve the Data Act. It's, a, it's an ambitious uh, legislative act already, but can we make it better? Can we find a, a way to improve it without anyhow redrafting it? Uh, but just make it stronger. And we think there is one proposal which does make sense, and, uh, and I would like to present it to you now. It's uh, yeah, this is it's all planned. It's going as planned. This is the suspense now moment. Uh, <laughs> it's my fault. I can't make the nice points. Um, yeah. So the idea is. Uh, waiting for the slides, but the idea is uh, a public data commons. So basically uh, to have a strong protection of public interest, but also to make as much reuse as possible, we think there could be an institution which also has a trusted infrastructure, which is specifically used to uh, strengthen public interest, to, uh, bring new, to, to bring competences, to generate public value, to provide legal and technical expertise, so basically to be a kind of role model, so to speak, for other data intermediaries. Because as much as we talk about data spaces and data intermediaries and data trusts, the last time I spoke to ODI people and I said, okay, point me to the best data trust in the world, they said, oh, there's, there's none. So it's still a, a dream we have and maybe we should, instead of waiting for the market to, to solve it, we should also uh, let the public sector solve it. So the idea is to have in the Data Act this small and yeah, it's it's not the best. You can oh here it's perfect. So uh, you see that the, the, this entire framework it's exactly the Data Act framework. There's just one step more, which we think does make sense, which is when the request is evaluated, we know it's not only an emergency situation, but there's a good public interest: healthcare, protection of climate mobility, um, you know, getting ready for 55, by the way. And all of this, um, if there's a, a sufficient public interest, 
we will have the data not only transferred to the party that is asking for it, so I as a user say, please transfer my data to this service provider uh, because I am the, the, the owner of this data, but also it is transferred to the public data commons, which aggregates this data, clears them, takes care of them. This is the first public trusted institution that we could have to increase this data sharing. So we propose this, um, we think this is extremely important because this will create a competence center for data sharing and because we know now it's all about uh, access, reclaiming our data basically, coming back to the first discussion on uh, you know, privacy and power, data is power and this uh, is our idea how we can um, create an institution that has this power to reclaim data uh, for us. And it will not have any other data than the ones that we already want to move it. So yeah, this is, uh, this is the proposal. You can find the, the report and the ideas on Open Future website. Um, it's, a, it's a starting point for our discussion. So let me head straight into the panel. Um, I will direct the questions at you specifically. But if any of you want to have some kind of advocation and comment or, or, or say that you disagree, please feel free, just let me know. And also I will try to um, have enough time for uh, a couple of uh, questions. So first of all, a question to Feo. Uh, do you think the Data Act is really set to achieve greater data sharing, greater portability for business? How this can uh, you know, empower innovators, and are there some possible traps or downsides that you see in the app? Because it sounds really great. That, that, that will it achieve the aims? That is a very interesting question. And uh, first of all, thank you for joining us, and I'm very happy to be here at this conference discussing uh, this crucial element of uh, the European strategy and opening up on, on data. And also to, to, to further elaborate on this, we need to get some understanding of where, where, where do we come from. We all, we all know the EU wants to be a leader in data after an initial focus on data protection with the GDPR. And then we realized, oh, yeah, we're behind the US and China, so we should do something. Um, uh, and the EU wants data to be a common resource, which is a good thing. Uh, and at the same time, thinking about access for purpose outside the EU, which is also a good thing. Uh, but actually, it is a balancing act, yeah? trying to, to balance out the best of two worlds, having the highest standards of data protection and optimal sharing of, of data. And then the question there is, can these worlds exist simultaneously? I think the answer is yes. And we're all here to figure out how we can, we can do it. And then there's, of course, the question, why, why should we all care about this? Well, like, the most briefest summary I could think of of the Data Act is it has three elements. And it regulates access to connected devices. It gives users the right to access data by their devices. And third, it gives the users right or require uh, manufacturers to provide data. The third part is on friendly terms. And friend and fair was discussed in the panel I just briefly before, which is really interesting. Yeah. So, there is a massive opportunity to get access to data. At the same time, businesses who have data now exclusively are really worried what would happen to those, uh, those data. Um, at the starting point that the Commission took, and if you look at Recycle 20, is um, that um, and the data should be made available only when the user actually wants this. Actually wants this. So if you put this in a thinking, and if what I, t I would take the counter argument, I would say, well, why, as a user, why should I release my data for usage by others if I have no control over it? Or I cannot take part in the financial gain yeah, that is cheaper the sharing of this data. And, and then that needs to be solved. So how do we trigger, how do we make the users um, more aware of the, the benefits of sharing and also to uh, 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 
to make data available for portability. And then when it comes to portability, what is really interesting there is that we see that the, the Data Act, as well as the Digital Markets Act, which Mount briefly touched upon, bring about a radical overhaul of mandatory data access thresholds in the EU, opposed to what courts have been saying in many cases up to now, trying to balance it out freedom to contract on the ownership's right with mandatory access. And many cases have been brought forward and are still pending on uh, the collection of the use of data, Amazon, or alleged self-preferencing, Google Shopping, Amazon Marketplace, mandatory terms for further access, Apple, Google AdTech, uh, access to and use advertising data. So we, we, we come a long way uh, from making sharing of data an exception to making sharing of data as, as, a, as a common good, as a, as a, as a starting point. Um, and then the th second observation there will be from what is what I can do with this data. So for me personally, um, uh, if, if I share my data for my dishwasher, uh, would, would there be an opportunity to compete with this data? Neither user or third party may use this data to compete with a genera data generating product. And this also goes for a gatekeeper under the uh, uh, Digital Markets Act who's been excluded and think you, you made the right choice not to, to put him, uh, uh, to have him not in the scope in this respect. Yeah. Now, my third observation there will be is that the data, data access train is running now uh, on the basis of the GMA and the Data Act wants to uh, make data portable, including data that is not easily accessible for instance, for instance, for after-sales markets with functional equivalents, and that is a component to the GDPR. So we have different regimes for different aspects, different types of data. And uh, the, uh, if we want to judge and, and determine the effect, we, we need to see them in uh, in the interplay uh, with them together, and that would be a very important thing to uh, to do. I would uh, would say, and then also. Uh, and sharing portability goes together with standards, and we definitely should not want to have um, a, a GMA portability standard, for instance, in Data Act portability standards. So that should, should be put more in, 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 in context on also on us to really make this work. Well, I'll leave it to that for my first uh, talk. Then, yeah. Right. Thank you. I really like when you said this uh, that you know data sharing should not be some kind of. Uh, a thing that happens uh, uniquely from time to time, but it should be a kind of like the new norm, sharing data as a, as a common good. And following this line of thinking on, on the common good, Francesco, a question to you. Why do you think the, uh, some kind of common good, some kind of public interest is important in this very regulation? And uh, can, can, it, can it be put there, can it be expanded without you know, having to create a completely new um, draft for example. Yeah, um, I mean, it's a draft is a unique opportunity to rethink really the value that we attribute to data. Uh, at the moment, we can see that the public sector is suffering arguably from a, a public value gap, where data is mostly seen as a commodity to be used to leverage competitive edges, but data is much more than that. Data is actually a sense-making resource in our days, and if we manage to reconceptualize what it means, we're actually able to fulfill cycle objectives stemming from data sharing and access to in the public uh, uh, interest. And data proposal tries to do so with new provisions for business to government data sharing, but at the same time they are a bit short-sighted uh, in a way. The Commission started in 2017 with the, with the communication of the European data economy, pointing to the needs of having a greater data for good framework to foster access to privately held data by public bodies, and this was later uh, complemented by the high-level expert group recommendations in 2020, which argued for a strong public interest framework. Uh, well, the data proposal is still based on an exception-based framework, uh, where you need to sort of prove that you have a, a limit, a, a, an exceptional need to access the data, and that such data must be deleted after having fulfilled such a need. 
So there is a need to really complement the proposal with a more ambitious mechanism that really allows public sector bodies in situations of public interest, which need to be explicitly defined and supported with sufficient proportionality and necessity criteria to access the data and use it to address societal pressing needs. But not only that, uh, that's only one side of the picture. What we also need is also to foster access to such public interest data to third parties which are then acting in the public interest. And this could be done by uh, extending uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, the scope of Article 21, uh, which at the moment uh, prohibits, uh, uh, limits, let's say, reuse of data to third parties by including SMEs, research organizations acting in the public interest. And this could be done actually by leveraging the public data commons model that the yeah, proposes, having a data pool, an aggregator which acts as uh, a channel for data access for those entities that uh, um, operate uh, in, a, in the public interest. And if we manage to do so, we can actually have uh, not only one sided commons where there is only, let's say, one stream of access. Uh, to data, which is mainly private companies that have an upper hand in determining who has access to data and which kind of value to derive from data processing, by actually having a proper commons or like a double sided commons where both public sector value and private sector value are both leveraged to accomplish uh, the goals in our data economy. Mm. Interesting. Walter, what do you say to, to those different comments and uh, ideas to improve on the data? What do you think? Well, first that I will update my slides and you will get an updated version with, which includes the health data space regulation. Because the health data space regulation, which I only commented on, um, includes, I think, a very ambitious mechanism that looks actually very, very similar to what we have on the slide here. In the sense that they take, took the inspiration from FinData, but also the health data hub in France as a vernacular mechanism to per, to allow the permissioning of data but not limiting as understand it in the Finnish system and other systems to public register data but ultimately bringing any county hospital you have to pass the SME threshold so your GP is not in range like unlike the, the UK experiment um, to, to, to be ready to be approached via the data permit authority as they call it by a researcher or an innovator says, I have heard that in the northern part of Finland there is a specific rare disease which is more prevalent than elsewhere. Can I have the data? The, the challenge is what I also commented to the, to the colleagues is that from the receiving side, so the, the data holding side, I mean, you need a certain predictability. I mean, you need to know how often these requests will come because it, need, it means you have to have resources, human, uh, IT and financial to just be able to respond and that's where also the comments that we're getting I mean where is is that a sustainable system from the from the private side I mean we have to make it sustainable financially uh, and then we can speak about compensation mechanisms I don't remember what the ultimate outcome was with the EHDS but I think it's uh, it's a cost-based system and private holders can actually get something out there but the, the costing rule is relatively reasonable so I think we're really for it. We want it also with the Data Act to go for institutions to say we'll, we'll oblige every country to have basically a, a, a data commons authority. Ultimately, that's not the way it works because you have to bring the, the substantive obligation. What is the right that I have as a researcher or as an innovator first and then say what's the mechanism. And to my own taste, we, we shied a bit away from looking at that, not the mechanism as well. But the EHDS, I think, is the, probably the best example of of getting to a health data commons and really support it if you are in the room uh, because it will trigger resistance not only because of the hospitals but because people will feel uncomfortable that knowing because they visited the hospital somewhere that tomorrow there could be secondary use of that data controlled by an authority and not by themselves so it's also a bit where we have to, to find a good balance on on staying in control as patients now in that specific case um, but it's clear that midterm we need more flexible access mechanisms. It's, it's not, not, not the right thing that the legislator has to go for legislation and say, you manufacturers of X or you providers of that, give me regularly tons of data, which I may need at some point. That's not a, not a good mechanism because it's storage and it's pointless. And so let's agree on more flexibility indeed over time. 
Thanks a lot. I think you raised a, an extremely important point about the uh, the control we have over data because. Uh, and I could see when I explained this public data commons very briefly that some of you were frowning and uh, I mean I, I, I get it why because there is a some distrust in, in public institutions or in, or in big institutions in general um, but the, the question is can we can we kind of balance it out right so have a have an aggregated uh, institution like FinData for example but also democratically democratically uh, oversee some kind of supervisory. Uh, I could point to some examples, but Theo, you want to have a voucher? I think what you just said, and uh, what you Malta said, and what you said, for me brings already one important insight, and that is that the growth of common data spaces will be spurred by uh, sexual developments in health or in, in finance, where it's, uh, you can it's far more easy to, to tackle where, where is the added value for, for all the players in, in the chain and develop it from two that. So that, that actually then the, the sexual approach towards finance and, and health will help uh, to, um, uh, to spur the, the ideas of the horizontal legislation like the data act. But for me that's one takeaway from what I just heard. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Okay, um, Malte, go ahead. No, just one other avenue. We spoke about altruism very, very briefly. But if patient groups say, we'll band together, we'll find a way to donate our data, so to say, that's another way to achieve the game. That's then control. That's then control. Will it really happen as our bet on with the Data Governance Act that these altruism organizations could actually cluster it? And then you can call it a cooperative or what you want. But it's hard. They haven't taken off. I mean, the, Health data cooperatives in Switzerland have been conceptually existing for 10 years now, and I don't think they have ever really taken off. So we need also to trigger that movement. Mm. But also the thinking needs to be ready in order to spur them, to take spur them. And maybe there are lessons learned there in, in the specific arena we could take on in the, uh, in the debate we're having now. Malte, following up on what you said, there's a question to you from Pernil. Uh, how do you see the trend that every EU country does its data trust or data ecosystem? Do you see any signs that the EU will be actually able to innovate here, get masses to join, win over convenient data harvesting companies? So maybe a question, you know, uh, about the label of data intermediary. Will, will, it, will it benefit somehow? Can we get those patients to, to do it? Well, I hope. Uh, but we also do, I mean, large-scale registers at, at European level with European financing on rare diseases and genetic information. I'm not an expert on exactly what they do. But there's also a public effort to build these registries for, as a public alternative to private harvesting. Maybe uh, I'll leave that as a speaking point. Right. Um, another question related to public, oh, you see the questions uh, as well here. But I, I, I think an interesting question from Vivi. Um, what if instead of mandating direct B2G data sharing in certain circumstances like public interest or the emergency that is now, could we think about investing in data spaces to which public bodies would then gain access for certain purposes? I would say from my side that it's a question of who should be kind of the trusted institution. Should it be a business one or a public one or a societal one? What, what, what is our theory of change, so to speak, right? Does any of you also want to comment on this? No, I agree with what you said. At the end, I mean, at the end, it's like a matter of who is the trusted intermediary of this, uh, this process. If it acts as in the public interest and only from private interest is that, of course, you have a single system which achieves the same, the same end. So, it's global. I mean, we conceptualize the space as being actually more of a network. So, having access to the space means having access to a network, but then you still need, to, within the network, to get to the data holder. Mm, the nodes. The nodes, those where the data sit. Um, because the space will not be a, a fishing pond to find data. I think that's really important. I mean, come to the next session as well. I see Lars Mark in the background already. We'll all speak about what's actually the data space. So I think it just flips around the question: who's obliged to give something, at what point, and when, and why? Right. And uh, yeah, I will allow this in a second. Uh, just uh, to to finish from my side, uh, I think I'm, I'm actually a cooperative entrepreneur, and I I love co-ops. I think this is economic democracy at its best. But sometimes the theory of change is that maybe we need. Know, strong public bodies because I don't know because they can 
act at scale, like for example, public healthcare, right? Um, yeah, I will. I, I think Nicolas' uh, question will launch us back to also my questions, so I will still like to entertain that voice. Can I pass them? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Isabel is here, I think, um, commenting on behalf of my data on the Data Act. Um, one of the things, uh, and also the demand for pandemics, which is one of the problems of crisis, Data Act Article 17 and Article 18 basically says that we don't need to inform the patient. If we get that, if public, health, public authority, sorry, have access to the data, there is no need to inform the citizen, which I don't think is correct. And two, they are also allowed to go up to uh, PII, so uh, uh, really identifiable information, if it's not possible to do otherwise. It's fine if it's really needed. There are alternative mechanisms, using data intermediary and processing services to link the data. My concern was that when I've been checking that with public health authority in the context of COVID for five countries, they said no interest and even one said, why should I care to find alternative mechanism if I have access to the data to something like the Data Act? So there is a potential with the Data Act that the citizen right I mean to be completely forgotten. And I think we need great to be careful. I mean, legally, we will argue that the health data space regulation goes first. It has also, because also allow is basically what we call business to government data sharing. It's actually a, a lex specialis rule. But here also, I, what the lessons that we heard is that to preserve the integrity of a cohort and the statistical representativeness, you should really be very careful to advertise the opt out mechanism, because otherwise you get a biased data set. And, well, and that, that's not what you necessarily want. So it's really complicated. I can see that. And then the other example that we use in the, in the Data Act is basically mobile network operator at scale, which in some countries are qualified at whatever level of aggregation to still remain personal data. And then, obviously, you can't ask any mobile network participant, every phone subscriber, basically, for, for any interaction for this to work. Otherwise, it's an unworkable mechanism. So it's also the question to what extent lawmakers say there's a societal consensus that we all agree we don't have to be asked about the data use. I can see on the, on the patient data it's a different matter, and I have to actually look up on the secondary. I think there's no real opt-out. There was a maybe hidden opt-out on the secondary use in EDH and the health data space regulation. OK, so uh, trying to move uh, forward in the discussion also, uh, uh, including uh, Nicolas' question. I think I will first uh, point this to Francesco and Feo, and then please have Malta as well uh, commenting. So first of all, uh, Data Act, it has the aim to innovate, uh, to increase the innovation and competition uh, in EU businesses, but you have to know that third parties that receive this uh, IoT-generated data cannot develop products that compete with original data holders, so they can build products which are uh, adjacent, which are uh, compatible, but they are not in the same the same type of service. Um, that's that's one thing. The other is also the scope of the regulation, right? So it's uh, in some ways it is limited to IoT. In some, in B two B sharing, it's much broader. I want to ask you: Do you think the scope of this sharing should change somehow? In what direction? And what would be the gain from it? Francesco, I see you in the starting. Positions. <laughs> no, I honestly think that it's scope and ambition of the Data Act in what it tries to achieve by uh, providing new access rights and enable greater data sharing is completely uh, sound. That is the right approach. We need to have an ambitious framework where we can, as users, have access to IoT data and then be able to port it to uh, different uh, uh, providers via access rights. Uh, we are quite happy that. The Commission did not resort to an opposite approach, which entailed that the data produces rights to enable data sharing. And it is in this context that also this question about uh, the, uh, the potential of, uh, of third parties to develop products comes into play. Uh, I guess that rationale for such an approach uh, was based on a market led uh, investigation. Um, where there was like a different regime for uh, for um, uh, access to uh, services uh, and products, but then of course uh, such a provision raises question uh, over the overall 
uh, let's say, nature of data in the proposal, because to a certain extent, uh, you are allowed to develop a completing service, so data seems to be almost a non rivalous resource, which can actually spill over benefits to different uh, players. But then on the other hand, uh, it is prohibited to be used for developing competing products. So this, let's say, is a double-edged question, which potentially also collides with the overall intention to share data via interoperability rights. And this will need to be addressed throughout the legislative uh, process. Um, and we see, uh, at least from my side, I see already a lot of civil society activity on that point, trying to have the same approach but for products and services. What's your take on the scope? Oh, on the point you just made, um, on, on aftermarkets you can't compete, but on other markets you can't. And, and the balance between the two, that will be a crucial question for, for businesses also uh, uh, to be aware of what, what, what can be done with the data, but also if you're the data recipient, what can I do with it and what can I not do with it? So, so some further guidance on, on how these two are interrelated will be really, really fruitful. And on the second part of your question, I'm not sure you're interested, is whether we should expand the scope of the, of the data. To, to platforms, clouds, uh, yeah, exactly. other... Yeah. I think oh, so. that, that would perfectly fit into your idea of the open future. Um, taking it back to what, what I said earlier, um, we're already making a huge step coming from uh, having data uh, sharing as an exemption to making it principle. Uh, and let, let's make sure we get this on basis of the report, make sure we get this right. And if we get it right, yes, we gained experience, we gained some trust, hopefully on the basis also, on the basis of the, the health data space for which the Commission has launched uh, the, the initiative. And then take a step further. Don't try to make too big steps. Otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll struggle on the next hurdle. That does, doesn't take away that I think it's a good idea, but let, let's make this um, uh, efficient for, uh, for the uh, next round uh, of the Commission, 24, 28. Right, so implement, check how it works, yeah. get feedback. Learn from things that we have not gone, uh, gone right, take out the benefits and then, and then readily expand. Mm -hmm. Okay, a comment on this? Yeah, I think it's, it's one of the last articles that gives you a preview that we might go further, but then the question is, is that a horizontal or a sector-specific rule? We, we wanted to leave a gap between online regulation which crystallized around the Digital Markets Act, so there was a deliberate focus given to gatekeeper behavior, because that can hardly better, and also we missed still a bit of signals from the market that there's a a data sovereignty problem, if you want, on the uh, on, on, on software products. Uh, I, I see my in the background, and the question is on this. So that's also what we're missing uh, a bit. Maybe on the reason, I mean, in, in three words, uh, for the competing, it's, it's preserving the first mover advantage, avoiding free riding and parasitic behavior. I mean, if, if you, and, and that also is important to conceptualize the IoT data as code generated not only by the user but also by the manufacturer. So, without the manufacturer bringing good products that have the sensors and the services that make, make certain sense of the sensors on the market, you also have no data. So, you need really to preserve that incentive, and that's going to potentially decrease the more, the less they can basically, well, exploit that resource exclusively or at least have an option to exclusively. So, so we have to bear that in mind that it's not we can't let that free riding on this one. Well, I hope this addresses also the question of Marianne here um, about broadening the scope. Um, okay, so before I uh, take one of the questions that is uh, that, that was posted there, I wanted to have a kind of like uh, or maybe let's have it now. Sorry, because I wanted to ask you for final remarks, but they should be in the end, right? Only that would make sense. Um, I think maybe let's talk a bit about the industry standards. Um, what, what, what is the role of industry standards in B2B data sharing? But let's think also not about B2B data sharing, right? Like industry standards also might play a role in APIs for consumers. So, um, And the, the Data Act is quite specific on this. So, Malta, maybe you want to begin? 
afterwards. I think what I said earlier is tremendously important because without the standards, the legal rules will only imperfectly work. But mandating now rules on everyone and every object seems quite far reaching. So we have to be A, from a, from a capacity to develop and the standards, that's one, and then also the adoption. And then also, I mean, announcing standards has always a chilling effect on experimentation. So we're, my personal take is I'd rather be careful, but we have to begin some other work and maybe look at the structural things. I mean, we will speak in the data space session also about the generic standards. Uh, that help data sharing in terms of policy option languages, authentication, set mechanisms, uh, ID. We had this discussion with this earlier. Identification of objects, companies, uniquely identifying. Now, there's a lot of transversal standards I think that you could probably uh, adopt. But then saying in what sense a paper mill should now share certain data of a component, I mean, that's probably an outlier that has to be solved differently. The question though on the, on the way you choose these industry standards, will it be self-regulation and then you just mandate okay this is what the industry chose let's go for this or do you want to take a look at for example the open standards that exist that are, that are open and interoperable by definition and then pick those and say this is the, the golden standard i'm thinking about the usbc chargers now right with like some kind of sensible process of reaching that this is the, the best solution yeah, we're, we're, we're procuring a support center for data spaces which will bring us certain generic standards in a voluntary manner and then we have to see whether in the funding uh, decision for funding support for a data space X will say you have to absolutely use this standard or not. That's, the, that's, that's one tool we also will, will want to use. And then there indeed in the data act as a reserve clause for the commission to say certain operators should probably could be obliged to use X. But yes, we would use the existing standards by preference they should be open, and um, whether they will be become mandatory, that's then really the last resort, because that can be tough as well. A comment on this, Theo Francesco? Okay, if not, then let's go to the final question. Um, taking a look at the, uh, at the entire <coughs> overview of the different regulations, right? We have, we have plenty of them. There's, there was the DSA and DMA, we have the Data Act, we have the uh, Data Governance Act, we have the 13 in total, right? Data space is coming, with the health data space being the first one presented to us uh, fully. Um, it seems like um, a puzzle with a lot of pieces. Uh, and I want a, a brief, you know, one minute uh, comment from you. Do you think the puzzle is coming together? Is it really creating a new uh, digital uh, economy, digital society, digital space in, uh, in Europe? And what do you think the Data Act brings to this, to this puzzle? And maybe starting from Francesco. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the puzzle is clearly coming together. I mean, it's not, all the pieces are not there yet. Uh, we have to wait uh, coming years, uh, especially seeing the intersection between sectoral and uh, horizontal uh, rules. But we definitely see a pattern in this regulatory activity. On the one hand, with the DMA DSA, we have rules which are aimed, targeted specifically towards online platforms. And this is done with the aim of decentralizing power and bringing a more fair data economy. On the other hand, with the DGA and DA, we're really creating a new blueprint for the data economy where data can be really accessed freely and more fairly across uh, uh, sectors. Within, let's say, these data sharing prescriptions, if you want to call them this way, but what will be very important is the intersection between sexual rules for data spaces and what is now proposed with the DA. For instance, if you look at the DA, there are a couple of concepts that are introduced, for instance, the operators of data space concept, which then does not come back into the European health data space. This is something that will need to be, for instance, uh, clarified throughout the legislative process. But the main goal is really to avoid friction between files and really having a good interlock between sectoral and horizontal rules to have legal clarity and certainty uh, in Europe concerning access to and use of data. Fail, mm -hmm. one minute. Um, are the pieces of the puzzle coming together? Yes and no. There will still be light between the pieces of the puzzle uh, if you don't pay. Uh, sufficient attention to the interplay between the proposals. For instance, on profiling, we've we seen stuff in the Digital Service Act and the Digital Markets Act. The same goes for uh, uh, dark patterns, which are all high sensitive elements. 
and to get that right in the imbalance is, is quite a thing. And uh, I've been giving client trainings on what I would call the big five, all these regulations, including AI. Um, but if we zoom out a little and we go back 20 years, then you will see that elements in the discussion that we've been having in opening up the telecoms markets, which incumbents say, well, network should not be open because it takes away my incentives for innovation and uh, uh, first mover advantage. And here you mentioned some of those elements. We've managed to tackle those. Uh, also in terms of managing frank and fair and reasonable terms of use, we have lots of experience as a society in, in, uh, in IP. So right. let's, let's take all, all these elements mm -hmm. and take the lessons learned and put them into the debate now. And that will really be my call to the European Parliament and the Council to, to oh, take those okay. lessons learned in the collective memory. We were absolutely right out of time. Thank you. And Malte is one of the authors of this uh, puzzle. Do you like the outcomes of it? Yeah, each puzzle addresses a problem and we pay utmost attention that they fit, but yeah, we'll, sh we'll polish uh, together with Mia Petra and the colleagues in the Parliament some of the edges of the puzzles. But they are only complete picture with also what happens in private to private in the contractual practice. But as I said in the beginning, sometimes we were criticized to be too slow and not reactive. Now we're kind of productive. And I think that, that is also a, a good news, maybe. That we're trying to solve at least certain target problems. Each act solves a problem. Great, thank you so much. Uh, great, many thanks to the audience. Uh, I don't know if there are questions, but the, the timer went red and now it's counting up. So I guess uh, we need to move the discussion uh, into uh, the hallways. So thank you so much for participating. Thank you.